It is a privilege to be here. I'm David Wise. I work for Stroud Water Research Center. And uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, I'm preaching to the choir on why buffers. So we'll skip over all of that. But I want to help share with you how buffers, uh, how to have success with these things. They, uh, it was a very humbling experience to spend uh, the first three years of uh, my work with Chesapeake Bay Foundation killing trees by the tens of thousands. Uh, and my dad says, any fool can learn from their own mistakes. It takes somebody with a brain to learn from the mistakes of others. So if you want to uh, jump on that little opportunity and learn from my mistakes, uh, we can all be better off for it in the longer run. So what I want to do, there's two presentations. Uh, and I can't, I can't merge them. I'm too dumb to figure out how to change a Google platform PowerPoint that a young buck prepared for me uh, into my old school stuff. So we're going to switch out halfway through and we'll just say, oh, well, he's not a millennial and we'll just have to put up with it. Um, first thing I want to do is set some context for you about how Stroud, ha how we at Stroud have ended up Doing the, doing, using the methods that we are currently using, and what are those methods? Because some of the research about the details on methods, if I don't have the broader picture, the broader context, it may not click for you, it may not make sense. So I'm going to take a bit of time to go through how do we go about installing and maintaining a buffer uh, as, a, as a starting point. So, and this work that I'm showing you, the insights, uh, I'm standing on the shoulders of a whole lot of other people, um, and uh, all of us are part of that reality. So. so I talk to a lot of groups. You guys are mostly southeastern Pennsylvania, I assume. How many are not from southeastern Pennsylvania? Okay. All right. So there's some. So the regional stuff matters, and I would just encourage you to be attentive to that. Um, I talk about our context because some of the assumptions about regions do, in fact, matter. Down here in southeast, we're working a lot of former pastured areas. We're working with a lot of invasives. Uh, we're working with rich soils, often for health of trees, sometimes too rapid growth that the trees are actually wrecking themselves. They're growing so fast. Um, so it's, uh, if, that's, if you're in New York, that's not your context. You know, the trees aren't growing too fast in New York, despite how rich things may be. I'm generally working with container seedlings. Uh, mainly that gives us a longer planting window. Uh, I think you can have success with any types of seedlings. You might, might want to use bare root included. Um, these things are hard to plant wrong. They're, they're, they do have one benefit over bare roots is that they have increased drought tolerance. We've found out in, in some of the dry years these things will go dormant and make it through. So it's only, the cost of this plant material is only about 20% of the overall project cost, so um, it may not be the, the best place to save money. I will say on installs, you can put those trees in the ground a whole bunch of ways and have success. Dibble them in, auger them in, uh, shovel plant them in. I'm less concerned about how you put the trees in. I'm very concerned about what kind of maintenance is being done, and <laughs> is there maintenance being done? And Lamont Garber, a colleague of mine, says, David, one of our messages has to be, if you're not going to maintain it, please don't plant it. We have too many failed buffers that become barriers to others uh, putting the practice in. So, so I say, do your planting with your maintenance in mind. Uh, we use five-foot shelters. That helps find, protect, and spray herbicides around trees that are installed. We use a center hole net method I'll say more about later on. For a long part of my life, I was fixated on which shelter to use. And I'll share some insights on that that may have relevance. Uh, I think that was sort of a rabbit trail, frankly, uh, significantly for a long period of time. Plan with maintenance in mind, I plant we plant our stuff on rows. That gives you the option that you can mow down the alleyways. The woman who raised the question about what do I do with all my noxious weeds that are coming in on the site, if the trees are on rows, you can mow. If they're not on rows, I'd say start over. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's too hard. Um, you don't have to put them on an Arlington grid. There are contractors who do that. Most of my stuff we put in on these sweeping curves that parallel the stream. 
It actually aids mowing. If you can run your mowers parallel to the stream, um, figure out how wide the mower is that's going to be on the site. And you can go two mower widths between your tree rows. You can go three mower widths. Figure out something that's convenient. And if you're scribbling furiously, this thing is going to be recorded, and I can also get you a copy of it. So um, I know how that can be challenging to. Um. The main threats I see, in my experience, are voles first, deer second, invasive vines here in the southeast, and particularly neglected shelter maintenance. Competing vegetation is further down on the list in my experience. And depending where you are, I've seen bears just go up one row of tree shelters and down the next row. They were all snack dispensers. They all had wasps in. The bears figured that out and they wrecked every last one of the tree shelters on the property. Uh, that guy's figured out I got to use wire cages. Uh, so there are other options. Spotted lanternfly, who knows? Uh, how many of you have heard the term the green death? If your planting gets swallowed up with chest-high grasses, your odds of success are really going to tank. That is termed by foresters the green death. And I've added my own addition to this, the brown death. Voles are ecologically critical native small mammals. They are a thin skin with four legs and a hot lunch for anything that flies, runs, or crawls. They're really important. But man, do they do damage on tree plantings. The green death is too much competition for light nutrients um, for trees by heavy grass competition. And the grass is more over harbor voles, which will kill the trees. Like that, that photo that I showed you, that's where these trees came out of. Three-year-old trees, these are my trees. This is part of the three years of killing tens of thousands. Um, really crushing uh, when that's your planting. That's when I was working for back the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. So, Dad says learn from others. Uh, nurseries, Christmas tree farms, orchards, and researchers have all coalesced to say the way you get trees to grow in this ecoregion is clean culture. What is clean culture? Uh, it's not a morally upright lifestyle. That may help, but it's this. Um, it is keeping heavy grass presence away from the trees that you want to live and prosper. You don't have to do strips. If, this looks a lot like a grow out at a nursery, right? That's a crep buffer, and it's a highly successful four-year-old crep buffer. Clean culture, sorry? Crap, yeah. Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, uh, USDA program. Um, here's a three foot spot. Sorry, it's a little bit dark. Uh, that's much more common. We're typically using three foot diameter spots. You can use strips, that works fine too. So an early study, and this was the part that killed me. Bern Sweeney, God bless him. Check the year on this. He has four year data that's in a referee journal in 2002 when I'm just reaching the apex of my tree killing. Who has time to read journal articles on how to have success with tree plantings? I'm too busy killing them. And, you know, it was, that was uh, a humbling reality when he had done and published the data to know how to have success with this before I was even really out there uh, really slaying them uh, the way I was. So this is out of that study. Survivorship on the left side, growth on the right side. And ma'am, if I'm blocking your view, please feel free to move. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to have an angle where I can see some stuff. Um, so what are you looking at here? This is survivorship percentages, four different treatments. Control was doing nothing. Mowing is short name for twice a year weed whacking. <laughs> String trimmer. Tree mat, three foot by three foot black vispore mats and herbicide twice a year, three foot diameter spot. Those are the four treatments. What did it do in terms of survivorship? Well, you can see. Growth, similarly significant differences. And the herbicide spots really were getting it done. Quick question? Your herbicide said glyphosate? Gly glyphosate, yep. Yeah. Uh, the glyphosate is neutral on, it's your formulation. 
Roundup has a sticker, a, f a surfactant. Mm -hmm. Rodeo does not. Okay. They're both glyphosate, so it's just the, it's whether or not there's a surfactant in there. So, and I will say, you know, if you notice, this is not a great total survivorship. Uh, a little detail here. That trial, the way he collected his data, he had sheltered and unsheltered trees all part of this data set, and the ones that weren't in shelters got hammered. They just got wrecked by the deer and rabbits and bulls and everything else. So, um, so don't, don't pay attention to the total numbers. Pay attention to the relative height of the bars because of that oddball reality. So here are the numbers. I went back to the study and I teased out just for the sheltered trees, all the trees in shelters. What, what Byrne's study was showing is where they were not using herbicide, they were getting about 16% survivorship. That's the control. And where they had herbicide use, it was, and I, I, I'm interpolating off of a bar graph that was never meant for that, uh, that's about 90%, something in, a little bit in excess of 90%. So herbicide, yes, it has its issues, but it has been our backbone for having success with reforestation in an agricultural context. Um, and I, I'm happy to say, I think we've got a next generation that we may be able to step away from that. Uh, we're early into those trials, but I'll show, show you some, what I think is exciting data that we may be able to step away from glyphosate. Mm -hmm. Quick question? Any studies on the impact of watershed though? We're using so much herbicide, we're gonna um, plant so many trees. Keep, gonna... keep in mind that most of agricultural landscapes that we're working in are getting herbicide treatments uh, some of them a couple of times a year on every square foot. And when we're doing three foot spots on a buffer, that's about 6% of the landscape. So there's a downside to using herbicides. The downside of not using them to date has been you fail to establish the practice. And if you're working at a scale where you can do hand weeding, string trimming more often, close mowing five times a year, uh, there are other options, but at the scale that we typically work, you know, we're 50 acres a year of buffers. Um, it's, it's just, it's part of the package for us. And, I, and there are other options. I mean, don't get me wrong. Um, so the other thing we noticed in that study was, oh, by the way, not only did you have 90% survive, but their growth rate was more than doubled where we weren't using the, the herbicide. So that has been our our mainstay uh, for a uh, couple of decades now is these three-foot herbicide spots. This is what it looks like. Backpack sprayers, that kind of a spot. Sometimes you can get away with once a year. Sometimes, depending on soils, conditions, rainfall, you may take twice a year. <coughs> I'm going to run through a quick, quick schedule, and if you really want these details, see me later, because I, for sake of time, I'm going to have to move pretty quickly. But in this time of year, we'd be going out, fixing stakes and tubes, because frost heave will be loosening them. If invasives are an issue, we found out, like preen that you may use in the garden, there's pre-emergence granules that you can put down the tube uh, to keep really nasty stuff like bittersweet multiflora rose from coming up inside your tube. By the time late April gets here, we're making our three-foot herbicide applications. You want the grass to be short but actively growing. If you wait for it to be too high, it gets really hard to do this effectively. Not only that, it's very, very tiring to walk through. Um, and then if every time we're going through a site, we're keeping an eye on these bird nets. And the nets we try to get off before the trees are up and get all tangled up into them and, and wreck their formation. By May, we're into our first mowings. We're looking for landowners to do that. Um, if you have herbicide spots, now there's a dead spot around every tube, and the guy doesn't feel like he's got to run the mower quite so close. If he hits 10% of the stakes every year, that's 40%. After four years of mowing, you've wrecked half of your plantings by, by the mower damage. Um, late May, if you've got a problem with invasives, you could hit him with a second dose of snapshot. We also have paid 80 bucks an acre for contractors come in, lift every blessed tube, weed out the invasive vines that otherwise wrap up and, and do the tree in over the years. Um, again, remove nets. July and August, another mowing. This time, mow first, 
so you can get yourself through the brambles, the nettles, everything else, then come in and spray after. You probably have enough of an herbicide spot remaining that uh, the mower can mow through there and what's coming up around the tube is really short and then that's really convenient to spray again. Um, so this is the sort of stuff you figure out, I've been working at this for 20 years now, uh, so what's your order of operations? Um, then late fall, a final mowing, especially if you've got a uh, risk of a lot of voles on the site. Voles are food items for any manner of predator. If you have that cover short, they're going to be exposed to predation and they're going to take a whacking uh, from the hawks and everything else. Um, we budget $300 an acre a year to do this maintenance. That's without the mowing. Two mowings at $150 bucks an acre would be another $300. It's not a bad idea to have reserves if you may have some invasives. Do this maintenance for three or four years. We use written, signed agreements with our landowners. They know what they've agreed to. We know what they've agreed to. They know what we've agreed to do. It's a very clear record. Um, if you can't mow too steep, too rocky, too wet, then just increase your spot diameter to a five foot, maybe six foot size. We're out on sites two or three times a year. If you get out there and are present, most issues you can deal with at fairly low losses and fairly low cost. Uh, when you don't go out there for two years, you get back and it's, oh boy, oh, I see. Um, then it's a real problem. Do you plant a garden and not weed it? I did it one year. I, I, I wasn't allowed. <laughs> I wasn't allowed to garden there the next year. Uh, we went away for August and that was enough. Um, we can't plant buffers and walk away. In our ecoregion, uh, it's, it's like planting a garden. You need to weed it. You need to take care of it. And site prep is critical. At minimum, kill the sod where you're going to plant trees so you don't have that stuff coming up inside the tubes. So here's the site getting the maintenance. He will mow the entirety of that site. That's terrible for for wildlife habitat. Absolutely terrible. But if we don't do that for a few years, we don't establish the trees. We, we lose too many of the trees. So it's a trade-off. I don't like this herbicide spot. I just like it better than not having one and losing my trees. Um, so keep in mind, we're working at transforming a landscape. Here's a corn crop way too close to a stream that's three miles upstream of a public water intake. You know, the atrazine that's on here is definitely getting into that, and somebody's definitely drinking it. So 20 years later, using this technology, this system of stuff, we can do this. Um, and I think that's... Okay, a couple more shots. Here's a, a site. <laughs> Not everybody has uh, sculptures on their landscape, but when you work in Chester County, you'll, you'll meet some people who have sculptures on their landscape. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and this guy put his money where his mouth was. These trees got Cadillac maintenance, and they have just thrived. Uh, that is, that's eight-year-old, that's an eight-year-old planting. Uh, and there's very few people spend as much money on maintenance on their buffers as that fellow did. So yeah. let me switch over now. Yeah, Bob, um, yeah, Brian. Can you uh, pull off on the mowing regimen? You showed two slides of bigger trees. Um, At what point can you let that grow up? You know, if we, get, if we get to about four years in, then we're pretty good. Okay. That's um, just a landowner's choice to keep mowing. Yeah, yeah, and, you, and they should be curtailing it. If it's crap, they are obliged. Uh, to curtail it. Uh, where's my mouse? At what point can you remove the tree shelters? Um, when, when the trees are about an inch and a half or two inches in diameter at the top of the tube. But you need a buffer of the burn. What we have, and this is another place I want to do some trials if we get a chance. I have seen good success anecdotally, taking a case knife, a utility knife, cutting that shelter vertically and leaving it on the tree. Okay, now the tree can push it open, it'll get better airflow. Some of that funky, too humid stuff as the trees fill the tube can actually wreck the trees. 
This isn't science. This is Dave's anecdotes until we get there with the science. Cutting that tube, leaving it on. Buck don't seem to like to rub on plastic. Uh, it doesn't get done what they're looking to get done. Um, and if we can have the shelter on, that's not going to be a net detriment to the tree. I think we're at a better point. Now, I don't have a data set to back that up. That's just, that's just my gut. So ask around. You know, all of us here, a lot of us here are working on this stuff. Some people here have as many years in as I do. Uh, so if we can pool our, pool our experience. Quick question. Yep. That one slide you showed had um, how many trees? When you say he, you know, he took care of that uh, tree in yeah. the Cadillac. Yeah, he had a very high density. How many would you, would you think he's planting? You know, and I finally heard a forester answer this question. I've been into, the, into this work for 15 years. It's like, I, I'm not a forester. I'm, you know, I specialize in writing grant proposals is what it feels like most weeks. Um, so... <laughs> The forester said, I said, what do you think about tree density? He said, well, what are you looking for? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, do you want wildlife and water quality or do you want quality timber? <coughs> I said, what's the difference? He said, well, if you want quality timber, you put in 400 to the acre so they drop all their side branches and now you've got these rockets that are shooting up that are as branchless as a bunch of arrows. That's quality timber production in Pennsylvania. He said, if you just want wildlife, water quality, habitat benefits, I said, yeah. He said, ah, 150. You know, so it's like, how can I be doing this 15 years and duh. So you learn as you go. I don't do this work alone. There's a lot of people supporting this. I happen to work at a odd ball place full of science types. I'm not a scientist. I dabble on weekends and evenings doing this uh, research stuff because it, it's, it's fun and it's, it's important. I love sharing it with other people. Um, but there's this guy and this lady. They do the statistical analysis. This guy goes out, sets up the trials, collects the data. I just sort of point and say, Kalen, we ought to have a data set on sliding, sli slitting these tubes vertically and see what difference that makes and how that works out. Say, so, okay, we'll think about all the sites we're doing. All right, I'm going to take you through a bunch of stuff and, and you'll see them as they come up, so I don't think I need to spend a lot of time walking you through every one of these topics. We've got a bunch of stuff to cover. Just leave it at that. Have you seen the center hole method? How many of you are using the center hole method on your net installations? Okay. Center hole is this one to one and a half inch diameter hole. You pull the net down to the point where it actually starts to spread and is a hole about that big over the top of the tree shelter. Here's normally how they would get installed. Oh, is this thing advancing on its own? Okay. Ah. Sometimes. So here's the tassel method on the left, on the right, sorry. The odds of a tree getting up through that on its own if that net gets neglected, it actually happens. It's freakish in my mind, but some will actually get up through there. Really low though. So the nets we use to keep the birds from going down and dying and making a mess of things. Huh, okay. That tube? Yeah. Uh, that's just a, that's a normal tree shelter. Um, we'll have a conversation afterward. So if you don't use, if you don't use the uh, center hole method and you neglect the tree with the tassel method, the odds of that leader getting out of there healthy are really slim. So Burn Sweeney said, what if we did this? What if we put in a inch and a half hole top of the tube he found out 75% of the trees can emerge when all the nets were intentionally neglected. A lot less tangling. But I asked Byrne, that's the size of a Peterson Bluebird box hole for a, that inch and a half. I said, do you know that the birds aren't going down there? No. I said, well, maybe we should look. So we looked for a couple of years, 10,000 tubes, 
This is while the contractors were lifting and weeding. I said, I want you guys checking whether there's dead birds in there. We found one. The net had been pulled down so far that it was about a three inch hole. It's basically not having a net on at all. So basically it worked. Oddball, and share your data with me. This past year we found about 20 dead starlings. Again, we were looking in not 10,000, but probably 4,000 tubes that year. Um, there seemed to be some beetle that was present in these tubes and it seemed as though maybe the birds were going after the beetles. They weren't carrying beetles, they were some other kind of beetle. Um, so we're not sure what's going on, but if you're using the center hole, tell us your results, tell us whether you're finding dead birds. And if you're not looking, you're not gonna find them, so I mean, you gotta look to find them. Um, we think it's ready for use. Um, this is not a recommendation to neglect bird nets, but we know that neglect happens. It's unfortunate, so. Voles have uh, <laughs> been therapy for voles. Uh, they've done a lot of damage to a lot of our planting. So in Europe, they use a product called a vole guard, that, black, or sorry, that brown springy piece of plastic. You open it up, you put it around the stem, and snaps back into place. The dollar bill there for a sense of scale. Uh, we tried some coarse stone mulch shown down there and then a, a type of stone called 2A modified that is coarse stones and fine stones. The, they call it crusher run sometimes. It's all the different size uh, fractions all mixed together. And the critical thing is that dirty 2A modified stone doesn't have the voids. And I looked at this, Burn Sweeney was testing this out. I said, Burn, I think those vo voids are so big the voles are gonna go right through that. Um, and what did we find four years later? That Volgard is worse than nothing. And that's statistically significantly worse than nothing. Because here's our control. Here's the Volgard. This is a two inch stone. It's as good as doing nothing. The 2A modified stone that finds mixed with the coarser stuff, uh, that, that gave us 76% survivorship after four years with no herbicide. That's one site. You don't make deployments of lots of resources over lots of acres based on one site, but it was a wake up moment to say, we may have something here. We are now, we have first year data on a couple more sites where we're trying this out, um, including that, that 20 inches of stone that we did at that first site, that's about half a bucket, two thirds of a bucket of a five gallon bucket. It's 40 pounds of stone, and my arms were longer till the day was over. You know, that's a lot of, that's a lot of schlepping of material. Here's about a 12 inch diameter. That cost, and actually this would be a little bit less than this, that's, that 250 was the cost for about a three foot spot, but it's almost all labor, hardly any stone. The stone was like, 15 cents a tree, uh, it was insignificant. Um, 250, you do it once, that may, that may be effective for five, seven, eight, ten years, we don't know. There's no science on this. Um, we know that the 36 inch herbicide spot to do that twice a year for four years is almost eight bucks. And it's a ton of logistics to get contractors out twice a year for four years. It's a lot of cost. Um, and when you stop in that fourth year, the benefits go away. There is no stone on the ground remaining like this treatment over here. So uh, we're, we're hopeful that this may be a useful way to go. More money up front, or sorry, more effort up front, uh, not more money. It's actually probably a third the cost. I talked to my guy, Kalen, who's in the field. He said, Dave, he said at, first, at the first year with the 2A modified, he said, I don't see much of anything coming up through. Hmm. I said, we'll have to watch because a lot of times the seeds will fall on top, root down through, not emerge right. through the stone. So we'll see. This is first year data. Um, it's not, we're not ready to deploy this yet on a wide basis, but it is encouraging. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but it seemed like you were spraying 
transportation back. That right. one purpose. But then the stones had a different purpose, which was to keep the holes away. We were, like or um, in my mind, the main reason we spray is for vole protection, the clean culture, to keep the voles off. There are clearly nutrient and water availability benefits. Vegetation. Yep. If, if there's competing vegetation there, that's going to cut into things. This is first year data that was collected in 2018. Was there water stress in 2018? No. You don't make science and decisions based on a single year data, but if you look at growth results, we're not suffering as a result of lack of eliminating that competing vegetation. Here's the herbicide spot. Yeah, sorry. Here's the herbicide spot. The other two are stone mulch. That's similar growth. Uh, I think I have survivorship too. Yep. So, and that's that looks better. That's no statistically. That's no difference. The far side. You know, the the small 12-inch diameter stone gave us uh, good survivorship. That's one-year data. So stay tuned. If it matters to you, stay tuned. We'll have more to say next year. So was that 2A, was it, uh, 2A modified. No, just shoveled on. Okay. It'll, you know, it'll settle into place over time. And it's a limestone base? That was limestone, and there are going to be trees, pin oaks, black gums. There's some trees that aren't going to like that. Uh, you can get crushed shale, 2A modified that's shale. We've used both already. Uh, I think there's probably trees that are going to do better with the limestone, frankly, that things are too acidic for them. Um, but so that number, uh, yeah, here we go. That growth number, that would include eight different species. This is a compilation of growth across our typical planting mix. That would have included pin oak and black gum. So even if the pin oaks and black gums were tanking, uh, the others were making up for it if, if there was a species difference. Uh, so the Volgard's no good. 2A modified, looks like it's working. Could be cheaper, more permanent. Uh, less logistics, and frankly, you know, I don't like Kale and Wiley on my staff strapping on a backpack sprayer and spending a lot of time breathing glyphosate fumes. Um, I know where it comes from. I know his family. Um, you know, do I want him getting non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when he's 50? You know, no. Um, so we're we're looking at this seriously. Yes. Thinking about the bulls eating some of that material also, and then having the uh, hawks eat them. Yeah. I don't know. Does it bio, I don't, I haven't heard any commentary on glyphosate bioaccumulating the way DDT did. I, I have no, no idea. Yeah. Know, yep. Uh, Pre-emergence herbicides in tubes. You guys who are not from the southeast, this may or may not matter. For the southeast, that's a bittersweet vine. That's, there's more biomass of bittersweet coming out of that tube than there is tree. And that vine is going to tank that tree and perpetuate a forest of bittersweet vines. Uh, birds eat seeds, bittersweet multiflora rose, they are dropping those, they perch on the tubes, they defecate down the tubes, and these seed packets with fertilizer to go with it, their feces are growing up in our trees. And I don't know that this is a problem north of the turn, north of uh, 80, west of State College, but in the southeast, I'm seeing places where we've got plenty of issues. Um, so I called a buddy of mine, Art Gover, who works for the Penn State Weed Ecology Lab. I said, Art, what can we do about these darn invasives coming up from the bird droppings in the tubes? He said, use a pre-emergence. He said, put a chemical in there that will not allow those things to germinate. Your, your tree is already a plant. This is not going to hurt your plant. It's already a growing, you know, three foot high thing. He said, this will stop the seeds from germinating. Um, and so it's a shake. We made a shaker to give it a dose. You just walk to the next tree. And you can do this while you're doing other maintenance on things. So you got to apply it before germination. Um, and let me show you the results. So a single shake, we weren't sure how much to put in. You know, a little four, four inch diameter tube. Does this stuff dilute out from under it? Hard to know. So we did a single shake, we did two shakes. There really wasn't much difference. The, a single shake, this is the recommended dosage, 
uh, reduced by 42% the amount of vegetation in that tube. Um, but it only worked for about three months. Then we had stuff coming through, including bittersweet, which was a problem. So the next test was going to be go back for more, more chemicals, was one of the thoughts. So we said, okay, Art, I got bittersweet coming through a one-time dose of snapshot. He said, you could add a second product. I'd recommend Route, and you're doing a cocktail now. Or he said, you could try doing it a second dose in May. So we did both. Uh, Brandywine Conservancy worked with us. We set this up on their property. Uh, a second treatment in May of even one of those chemicals, snapshot, eliminated all the weeds straight through August. And we've figured out, okay, we've got an answer for our bittersweet vines. It was sufficient. We didn't have to use two products. We didn't need to use, um, you know, additional active ingredients. Um, I have the growth and survivorship data. It's clear that there is no impact by this treatment on, on the growth or survivorship of those trees. So if you've got a problem with vines coming up inside, the other option is, you know, lift the tube, weed them out. But if you leave them go for even a year, uh, you've really got uh, a deal with the devil trying to deal with them afterwards. Uh, where are we on time? Can you give me a sense then? 12.05? Okay, and I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> I spent a lot of wasp stings, a lot of sunburn, and a lot of time and energy when I was working for Chesapeake Bay Foundation. We tested seven different types of tree shelters on about six farms, more than 2,000 trees, and science can be very brutally um, painful sometimes. That came back vented, A.M. Leonard, non-vented, Tubex, Tree Pro. It didn't matter. There was, there was out of seven different shelter types, three different manufacturers, vented and unvented, it didn't make any difference which shelter we used for, for growth and survivorship at year four. Now, in that mix of tubes was a tube that was a continuous plastic extrusion, and if you didn't remove it, it will girdle the tree by about year seven. That's not a tube we're using. But it was a tube that was common on the landscape at that point, and we didn't, hadn't learned that downside. So the, the Tubex product and several others have a laser perforation that a, the tree will basically be able to split it out, burst out of that shelter. Uh, sometimes leaving that shelter on to that point, it gets funky with leaves and mold and excessive moisture. Um, my point is, there, I don't think it's a worthy pursuit, particularly for you folks who are not here in the southeast. I don't think it's a worthy pursuit to spend a whole lot of time asking which shelter grows us a tree fastest. I do think it's a valuable process to say which shelter can self-remove, which shelter has uh, integrity of construction, and the, the tree, uh, sorry, the Tubex product line has done very well with that regard. What I'm trying to answer with these tests of shelters is I've got about 15% of my trees that grow so fast in a standard Tubex tube that they get up, their stems are not strong enough to support the massive top growth they have, and they wreck themselves. It's too much fertility, too much growing season, too much good stuff, and these wonderful sycamores, river birches, and silver maples by the time they're into their third growing season, they're kinking the tubes, they're snapping the stakes, they're tearing the ties out of the tubes, and now they're laying on the ground where the mowers are gonna run over them. Or the guy's gonna have to get off the mower every 40 yards and he calls me up and says, this is intolerable. I can't, I'm gonna have to charge you twice as much because I'm gonna have to fix every one of these darn things and I don't have stakes out here. How am I gonna fix this? So I am looking at these tubes specifically through the lens of, can I find a tube that slows my trees down and grows 
a tree that isn't wrecking itself by the third year. And I had a, a guy in Mannheim, he's a landscaper, was hired by Kreider Farms who put in a whole lot of buffers and he went out and cut panels into every one of his tubes with a case knife to increase the ventilation because he saw them growing too fast. He knew this was not good. And he cut those holes in and I said, Brian, tell me how that works out. Because I didn't know, you know, field mice love to climb into these tubes, gnaw on the trees and make a nest in there and then the tree's dead. It has worked out okay for him. I think there's better ways to approach it than, man, think about the labor for that. A couple of thousand tubes, cutting several four by six inch holes in with a case knife. If your price of milk went up at Kreider Farms, you know in part why. Um, so here's three tube types. Combi is, can you see the ventilation holes in there? Um, Plantra, same basic ventilation patterns. Standard tube X, no ventilation. So I'm looking for a tree that can increase the, or a tube that can increase the ventilation to slow down my fastest growers so they're not wrecking themselves. That's what I'm talking about. That's heartbreaking. That's as bad as having the voles chew the roots off. You know, that's, you can't get a mower past there. It's, it's, it's maddening, so. And we have sites where it's like a third of the trees down on the eastern shore, former ag site, excess fertility. So the manufacturers of this tube say, David, do you really want to measure the performance of your tree shelter by how fast you can grow the tree? And I said, well, I don't anymore because I'm finding out that's not a great measure of success. How healthy is your daughter? Well, how tall is she? You know, so Plancher said, our trees will grow not as fast. Expect it. And they said, and our trees will be fatter. We've never measured caliper on trees before. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. So, okay, Kalen, got a new task for you, baby. You're gonna be measuring caliber of trees six inches above the ground on a couple of thousand trees. Great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. But we needed the data. We needed to know, is this for real? And Plantra is growing shorter, broader, thicker trees. And this is Year one, baby, don't, don't forget, we're a long way from changing our methods. Um, but there's hope here. Uh, if you're seeing trees that are wrecking themselves, uh, the ventilated tubes may be a good place to go, uh, Plantra. And Plantra has some different optical properties. There's different wavelengths of light getting through that I think are probably involved. Yeah, it was sycamores, river birch, silver maples. You know, some of our really strong performers. And I would say green ash, but we had to stop planting them because of the emerald ash borer. Uh, and then the, the uh, survivorship, just to make sure that we're, you know, you gotta look at both growth and survivorship when you're doing these studies. Um, they're, they're comparable, there's no real difference going on there. Uh, how many of you include uh, multi-stem shrubs in your buffer plantings? Okay. We have been doing that and most of them end up looking like this. The multi-stem shrubs aren't well suited to a five foot tall tube. When you put them in a two foot tube, that's what the deer do to them. Um, they're being gnawed really heavily. Uh, so we use these shelters uh, so we can do the herbicide for the vole protection, and we do that for deer protection, but the two-footers don't get it done in the deer protection. So what about doing your deer protection with something other than the tube? How about a fence? So I'll show you what we're trying out. So here's two-foot tube. We can spray around it. That'll deal with the voles quite nicely. This, <laughs> this was Dave's idea. Uh, it didn't work out so well. The deer are gnawing those. I don't really like putting welded wire fencing on properties where I know eventually there's going to be some unfortunate guy operating or gal operating a mower is going to wrap that <laughs> welded wire fence up into their mower and 
curse the guy who ever put the stuff on their property. Um, I said, could we put in wooden stakes and just string up baler twine? Because this four foot high fence is really only a mental barrier to the deer. They could almost step over that, but they don't choose to jump in. Um, what I saw here was the deer were just stepping in and sticking their head through and browsing things off. Um, maybe if this were 20 by 20, the ones at the center would be fine, but um, anyway. So uh, the thing we tried this year was as an alternative to the welded wire, which worked great, that was clearly working, could we use uh, some of this one inch grid plastic fencing? And we used some really light stuff and we used a much heavier grade and those are here. And they are working as well as the welded wire fence. A little harder to get it to stay upright. Um, it is, you know, putting plastics out in the environment is not great, but I don't like putting welded wire out for a landowner either. That probably is going to get neglected and be there for too long of a time. Uh, but it's working. So if you're looking for how do I get my multi-stem shrubs in, you know, there are some shrubs, service berry, uh, viburna, uh, sorry, uh, black haw viburnum, um, red bud. There are some shrubs that will be fine in a five foot tube because they're basically tree form, single leader shrubs. But the multi-stem shrubs, we have not seen prospering well in a five foot tube. And I think that putting in some fenced areas, um, and these are only four foot high fences, uh, but there's a, there's a behavior within deer, it's also within horses that a, small areas they don't like to jump into. You know, you want to keep the stallions out from the mares, you put up two regular five foot fences that they could jump quite easily, frankly. Um, but two fences 10 feet apart, they won't, they won't do it. They don't go there. Uh, and it's, I don't know if it's visual perception or what it is, but they, they won't jump that. Legacy sediments. Um, <laughs> Well, Stroud has opinions on some of this stuff, and you'll, you'll pick that up. Uh, legacy sediments, these accumulated sediments, whether it's behind a mill dam, and you saw a map of that earlier this morning, or whether that is simply sediment coming off the steeper ground, and when it hits the flats, the water velocity drops and the sediment settles out. Legacy sediments are... There's a reason why our society would want to remediate them and remove them. Uh, there are projects where that can be economically viable if the topsoil has value and you can have access to the site. There are sites where removing all that legacy sediment is going to be enormously expensive and maybe our society would like to prioritize its scarce money for more cost-effective approaches. That's a that's a perfectly valid discussion to have. I will say I'm presenting this to you because we have heard repeatedly voices saying you can't plant buffers on legacy sediments. They won't make it. They won't succeed. And if you think about it, there may be motives why someone would say that that aren't motivated by truth telling. So Bern has finally had a nose full. He said, I'm just going to publish a paper on it. So, so we've got a paper that's coming out, um, should be out this year, looking at uh, survivorship and growth of trees and legacy sediments. So here we are in Chester County, three to five foot thick legacy sediments. We put in just over 2,000 trees. The four orange experimental plots over there on the right. This is where the data set comes from. 68% survivorship on legacy sediments after five years. That's not a great number. It should be, I think we should be looking at something like in uh, 85, 90%. But you heard me talk about maintenance earlier. I don't know, I don't know what Byrne was thinking. There was, there was no herbicide used around those trees, and the site only got mowed once a year. So he was sort of flaunting all the stuff that the Watershed Restoration Group has been harping on. 
he sort of just threw it out the window and said, ah, it's not working out. I don't have people to do that. We'll see how they do. And I think it was a happy accident. Um, the legacy sediments weren't a problem. I'm just surprised that the lack of maintenance didn't cause more issues. That's not a great survivorship. Given that there was no maintenance, I think that's actually surprisingly good. So here's the site, five years old. These trees are not suffering. Um, legacy sediments are not a barrier to growing, to growing trees. Um, so the paper's coming out, <laughs> sort, of, sort of pointy. Removing sediments appears to be unnecessary for successful restoration of trees. So. What, what I've always heard about tree establishing them on legacy sediments was not so much that the soils weren't perfectly fine for growing trees. Right. It's that um, planting a stream buffer, you know, we're all taught and understand that a, a good um, forest root along the stream bank is going to help hold the stream back together. But if you have a legacy sediment layer and the erosion has gone below the, the, the dense root mat, that planting trees doesn't work to stabilize stream banks in those situations. I, I would say those are, those are hypotheses. You know, I, I don't think there's data sets on that stuff. We've got some uh, legacy sediment pasture on the property that 20 years ago we reforested before any of this discussion kicked up. That stream has more than doubled in its width. The roots have uh, generated a stability. Uh, and maybe this is a one-off where the, the confining layers are different. But um, I'm, I will say, in terms of the ability of the trees to grow, um, they will do just fine in legacy sediments. If there are reasons, and a lot of times, if you're going to work on a system that has a fourth order magnitude stream, um, and it's laterally cutting, then you're really faced with the question of are we going to try to treat the bank instability on site or are we going to spend a similar amount of money up watershed and try to deal with the hydrology? So I think these are all fair questions. We didn't think it was a fair assessment that you couldn't grow the trees uh, that's, and that's what this is trying to get out. So you may, you may have a point that needs to be you know, fleshed out through time and, and maybe exactly right on the money. So. so I think what we're seeing is you can grow them. You know, deep rich soils are not barriers to tree growth. In fact, when you remove the legacy sediments, now you're returning your trees and their root systems back to a much closer proximity to soggy soil conditions. And that is good at one level for the reconnection of a floodplain to the stream, that the flood, the flood stages can get up and get out of the banks, that's a much better condition. It will limit your palette of trees. You're going to have to be much more careful about what species you're putting in there, um, but it's, it's, not, it's not a problem. You know, I think our, our only real point on this is the trees will grow in legacy sediments. Uh, yes, it's ideal to remove them. Is that economically viable is a different question. But so. doesn't removal of legacy sediments potentially create a siltation problem for the water body next to it? I mean, the construction access, uh, you move it around? And sure, and there will always be some short-term uh, sure. costs of any, you know, even stream, re stream restoration is, you know, very much akin in that regard. I think we need to be prepared. There's going to be some short-term pain for some longer-term gain on a whole bunch of things we do including glyphosate. You know, here I'm preaching the glories of glyphosate and, you know, we know it has a downside. So, yeah. Um, how do you know you're dealing with legacy sediment and you said you need to be careful what species of trees You need to be careful if you remove them because now it's going to be soggier and you need to pick wetland adapted trees. If you're planting legacy sediments, you've got a broad, broad palette. You'd have to have somebody who knows soils to tell you that. Uh, my point is, you know, we can grow trees with or without legacy sediments. Um, so here's, uh, if you are, uh, have the personal nature to learn from contractors, uh, if you have that humility, um, these guys are a wealth of knowledge. This is Bill Tatey, who runs Tatey Farms. Uh, uh, I think Bill is just dabbling. 
Uh, he's earned his money doing other things earlier in life, and now he's doing restoration work. Bill is a great uh, ally for me because he has so much practical on the ground knowledge. I, I call Bill up and I say, Bill, I got another one for you. He said, what do you got for me this time? I said, I got two acres of head high, wall to wall, multi floor rows. He said, oh, this should be fun. <laughs> and here's the site. Multiflora rows can be a real challenge for reforestation. So this is the view from near the stream bank looking up the slope. I mean, you, couldn't, you could not physically walk through this. Bill says, David, I think I have an answer for you. And it's a forestry mower. So, and I don't think OSHA recommends this, but they tilted the mower deck up and drove straight into the <laughs> multiflora rows. I hope there's not a deaf turkey hunter in there because he's she's in real trouble um, so that site is what you were looking at this is now after we mowed it and planted now keep in mind now we have two billion seeds in that soil and four thousand or you know fifteen hundred 4,000, 12,000, whatever, live rose bushes that have just been sheared off. So that's just all waiting to come back. So we let it all come back uh, in mid-June. Here's another great use of glyphosate. We went in with a high-pressure hose, bulk tank, and we sprayed every square foot of that site with glyphosate. That, those rose bushes were up two feet high. It killed all the mature rose down to the rootstock. Now all we've got is left is two billion rose seeds that are perfectly happy to come up in that, con in that condition. So we sowed pasture grasses at a very high rate. We limed and fertilized so the grass would outcompete the rose seedlings coming up and whatever did make it, the follow-up mowing would take care of. So that's what the site looks like now, actually looked like a couple years ago. This is after two growing seasons and to give you the convincing before and after shot. You can see the conifers on the horizon. Um, that was not cheap. That was about $1,500 an acre just to do the site prep. Okay, <coughs> But you can have victory. Uh, it takes some experience and some resources. Can, reed canary grass. NRCS has gotten to the point with CREP. They say, if you've got reed canary grass, we will not enroll you in the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. We cannot establish the practice. And I think the answer is you cannot establish the practice if you're not going to do any follow-up maintenance. Because we have been in these reed canary swamps, and those are trees after two growing seasons, and they're doing just fine. Now, that doesn't happen to be the wettest reed canary swamp that we've been in. We do have a really wet one. Uh, at the bottom end of our property, and we have 86% survivorship of trees in there after three years, doing just fine. You just got to do your herbicide, and you got to do your mowings. Um, so here are uh, five typical sites throughout Chester County. Three-year survivorship is actually, this number is about 93. My apologies, we had a couple of sites in there that are only two years old. I only caught it late, but it's about 93%. Um, in the Reed Canary Swamp, 89, and then a, the really wet Reed Canary site, 86%, and that included some live stakes. We always have some losses with live stakes. They don't all make it. But those are, those are numbers that work, and that's largely a reflection on maintenance. Uh, we have some trainings coming up at Stroud. If you're interested, let me know, Friday, April 5, Tuesday, May 7. And then that's the end. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions, so, okay. <coughs> so, ma'am? Uh, I just want to make a point because I'm also a landscaper. When you're doing the multiflora rows, I'm assuming you're using a glyphosate rated for woody because a regular normally doesn't work. Um, I would have to check back with I Bill what kind of rating, yeah. what kind of dosing he used. <coughs> okay. Did you have a question? Yeah, well, how about the pre-emergent? You have a lot of research on that. It's not great, but... On human health, you mean, or...? Yeah, the watershed and... Okay. And, and, and. 
you know, so we're putting on a treatment on a four inch diameter tube. We'll do that for probably two years, gets it done. One of, one of Kalen's new questions is, Kalen, once that tree's emerged from the tube and the birds are no longer sitting right on the top of the tube and dropping their seeds, what kind of recruitment of nasties do we get once the trees have emerged? Are the birds perching and dropping seeds at the same rate, getting into the tubes, or can, can we drop this? Is, do we only need this for two years, maybe, uh, to treat you know, four of these areas times 150 per acre? Um, I'm prepared to say that I'm willing to put that amount of chemical out to get to my outcome, because we watched the neighbor who put trees in and had bittersweet vines coming up inside, and they are fighting the devil. They waited three years to do anything, and it's, what do you do at that point? They're too big to pull out by the root, so they're clipping them off, and then they're just growing back. Now you got a stump sprout. you got to stump treat every one by hand. Uh, so, yeah, and there are drawbacks. I, I'm not... I'm, not denying that for sure. Other questions? Well, just, just a thought. You know, a lot of us write these tree vitalize and now DCNR repairing buffer grants. And I just think it would be really neat if they had a link for your research or somebody else's research bundled up as a go to this portal mm -hmm. and read what's current. Because I can remember yeah. years ago writing in bold guards because I was, I was asked to. You know, and, and right. it would be really great to just have DCNR sort of take the heat off themselves and say, here's a body of research that's been done by others for tubes and guards and mowing and herbicide. And, and you know, rather than call out the, the, the issue of herbicide yeah. to all of us in our minds right now, yeah. but like, you know, when we write these grants, we're coming after a year of convincing someone that that should happen and that we should write this grant for that buffer. And so. It'd be really great to have your current info somewhere. Yeah, and, and, and we need to get it up on our website. I will say there are regional differences, and there are professional opinion differences. Uh, there are people who have, feel like you know, Virginia had been using tree mats. They just finally stopped using them within the last couple of years. Um, you know, so, and I, Stroud is not the only voice. You know, oh, know. Yeah, yeah. Conservation yeah. Services, yeah. Inc., Lowry Tucker, uh, they do a ton of work. He's got his own thoughts. They're, we're not divergent. You know, there's not a, lot, not a lot of points where we would diverge. Some details. Um, so I think DCNR wants to be careful about saying, here is the definitive voice. I'm, I am a voice. So I, I, that's what um, I mean. Like if they could just dump us over to where yeah. all you guys are doing sort of like a, a live chat and yeah. update on your data, it would be really neat. And that would be something that we really ought to do. I was yeah. six years into sometimes killing a lot of trees before I was in a room with 16 professionals doing what I was doing and we were kicking around ideas and said, why have we waited this long? That was 2006, so now it's been 13 years since. Uh, I did convene a group last year and we kicked around ideas, but we're, we're too busy. It's, it's, yes? One of the problems I see is that you get lots of health to plan. Yeah. A lot of support, money. Yeah. There's no money for maintenance. Right. right. Very little support because there's nothing exciting yep. about doing that. Do you find it's better to maybe put more money into a bigger tree that would require less maintenance? I don't have science to speak to that question. I think there's good reason to believe that planting fewer and larger stock, that also makes your maintenance considerably less, yeah. because you just have less to deal with. Um, no, no science. So happy when they have to oh, they're, they're yeah. okay. You, yeah. you just need to get the right volunteers. No, I, students will first. I would say to be careful about how much you bite off and just, you know, as you oh, know, yeah. try well, to this way you're doing a small try to work within what you projects, know you can maintain. Yeah. And, you know, I was invited by a funder to write a maintenance proposal and after a pretty stellar batting average on proposals, the one they invited me to write to do maintenance, they didn't fund. It's like, <coughs> you have got to be kidding me. You know, they don't want to fund it. They it's not it. sexy. They're so not we've, we've learned we've got to build that in as a part of every time we go in for an ask, there's got to be a little bit of money for the maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can always hire 
have somebody do that work. Yes. Oh, yeah. We. I love volunteers, but man, at the scale we're working, I, I, it would kill me. And, and volunteers um, don't do the same job that yeah. somebody So we college. we are hiring the help and very happy with that route. So uh, we're probably all done on time, I'm guessing. So I'm happy to stick around. Happy to go to lunch if you got stuff you really want to chew on. So thanks for coming out.